you ate. Yes. It is the very bundle before you, Chair. Uh, yes. I recognize it because it is It's just endless. that uh, the, the eight is not there. There is file nine. Well, um, I'm not too sure why mine is marked nine. Eight, you eight, yours. Yeah, mine is, is not. It's, it's, it's marked oh, volume U, file nine off. Yes, it's file nine, but... But it is exhibit U. U8. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Chair, if I may quickly orientate uh, you and other interested persons about the contents of that file. You will see that it begins with an index. Yes. And the first part of the index is the statement of Mr. Opperman. Yes. It runs from page 1 to page 18. Yes. The statement is fairly short by size only, yes. but it's extremely voluminous in terms of content and substance. Yes. So we will take a bit of time to converse the contents of the statement. Yes. And what follows thereafter are annexes yes. described through acronyms GJ01 up to GJ039. They begin from page 19 up to the end of page 440. What we asked the administration of the commission to do Yes. is to separate each annexure with reference to the file divider so yes. that it will be easy for you to simply jump into yes. the divided annexures yes. uh, conveniently. Yes. And we asked your registrar to bring along two additional files because there may be some elementary... She brought five. Uh, yes. <laughs> The first one, Chair, if I may remind you, is the statement of Mr. Clinton Efron, who testified on behalf of Glencoe. files which are here do not appear to show on, the, on their spines that any of them includes Mr. Efron's statement. There is uh, one which is uh, uh, which contains the statements of Mr. Mashiko Mashifo and uh, Mr. Pesta. Yes. Then there is Exhibit U2. It doesn't, or oh, then it shows that the statement inside is that of Mr. Naga. Yes. And then there is uh, Exhibit U4. It just says File 5 off uh, on the spine. Okay. Yeah. Then there is. Um, uh, exhibit U4 that has got the statements of Van der Riet, yes. Magwaza, Petzo. All of those files except the statement mm. and annexures to Mr. Naga, yeah. uh, which is U2, yes. will be used later by Ms. Hofmeyer. Yes. Can I ask you just to lift up yeah. U2 and put it conveniently next to you? U2. U2, yeah. That is the statement of Mr. Naga. Yes. We will refer to that file, mm -hmm. and we will do so when we deal with Mr. Opperman's evidence relating to calculation of penalties, because you'd recall that Mr. Mukwena took you through yes. the various calculations, yes. and you asked a number of questions, yes. <laughs> and Mr. Opperman, for his sins, yes. fundamentally differs with that calculation. Okay. And okay. Uh, he will begin to answer some of the questions you raised with Mr. Naga and Mr. Yes. McQueen about. But is this yes. a simple problem of miscalculations or yes. undercalculations? Yes. And where is the corrupt yeah. intent on that yes. score? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. No, thank you. Now, have, 
Uh, is Mr. Efron's statement included in the same bundle where we've got Mr. Naga's statement? Or, it, it or is have not. we not find it, yeah. found it? But you should not be concerned About by it. its absence for now. Okay. Because what we're going to do is to cross-reference yeah. some of the annexures is in Mr. Uh, Opperman's statement to those of Mr. Uh, Efron's Efron. annexures. Yes. But we will... We might not need... We might not need it. Okay. Yeah, I may have to read them out to yes. you and indicate where the cross-references would take place. Okay. No, that's fine. Oh. Okay. Uh, Chair, subject to any further introductory mm. remarks or yeah. queries you may have, yeah. I would ask your registrar to administer the oath Yes. From uh, Mr. Opperman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Opperman, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Advocate Malika. Uh, you, like me, speak a bit softly. Can you make sure that your, 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 your voice radiates through the microphone so that all of us can hear you? I will do that. Yes. Um, can I just begin with formalities? Uh, before you, there is a file which has been submitted to the chair as Exhibit U8. And that file begins with your typed statement which you made under oath, correct? Correct. Can I ask you to go to that statement and uh, go to page 18. I'm there. Can you confirm that the signature at the top end of that statement is yours? I can. And that's uh, your statement bears a signature of a commissioner of oath which you took on the 27th of February 2019. I can confirm that, yes. And where did you take that oath? In Emalatleni, Wetbank. Wetbank? Yes. Okay. Emalatleni? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Opperman, you have had an occasion to read and reread the contents of that statement, correct? Yes, yeah, correct. Do you confirm that they reflect the truth as far as you are concerned and to the best of your knowledge? Correct. Is there any aspect of the statement you'd like to reflect on, change or modify before we start with the substance of your evidence? Um, yes, Mr. Malika. Um, it is the, state, uh, the area that refers to the penalty provision and the amounts um, as per my Annex 18. Um, All right. Can you take us first to the body of the statement, which deals with penalties? As far as... So this is um, uh, point number 47? Yes. On page number 9? Yes. What's the page? Page 9, Chair. Yes. And you say you want to make a modification with reference to paragraph 47. And you have drawn our attention to Annex G, J, 18. 
Chair, you will find that from page 252. <coughs> Yes. It is that spreadsheet which has different color codes. Yes. What in that annexure would you like to reflect on? Mr. Malika, the, the um, calculation that reflects on Glencore's penalty as plus minus 18 million, if one reference Annexure GJO18, that amount was 13.8 million. Yes. Um, it might not be that significant, but um, that is the correction to be made. The other amount is 720 that I. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Opperman. Let, let, let me get first where you want to make the first amendment or correction. I am at uh, page 253 on the spreadsheet, and maybe you would help me by telling me in relation to which month, against which month that item is. Jerry, it is the total on the third, uh, the fourth column at the bottom, the total that reads 13.833 million. Yes. So it's the sum total on the... Oh, okay, okay. That is on the, the sum total of the penalties as calculated and contended for by Glencoe at the Correct. time Correct. when there was a debate between it and ESCOM about the quantum of the penalties. Correct. How much do you want to change that amount? To the 13.8. 13.8. Yes. So do we, do we cr cross out 33692? Just tell us once again, Mr. Yes. Berman. What is the number that should be reflected there instead of 13.833.692.75? That, uh, Chair, that, that amount stays as it is. We need to change in my affidavit. Statement. Uh, in my statement point number 47, I made reference to the calculation as plus minus 16 million. Oh. So that 16 needs to reflect 13.8. Oh, okay. okay. So, Chair, if you can go to page... <coughs> Nine of the statement and go to paragraph 47. The second last sentence of that paragraph refers to plus minus 16 million. So, Mr. Opperman, you want us to strike out that amount and replace it with 13.833 million. That's correct, sir. Uh, do you want us to say 13 point, uh, 13.3 million? You, I see you have got plus minus before that. I am uh, comfortable if we make it uh, 14 million plus minus something like that. Um, or plus minus 14 million. That is fine. Okay. Uh, I'm changing to say plus minus 14 million. And then, Mr. Maleka, with your leave, I'll leave the plus minus 720 million, um, which is pretty much in line in to the amount 723 million that is reported in that spreadsheet. So yes, yes. We'll, we'll get to it in due course, but correct. you're correct. It's plus minus. Yeah. We won't hold you to the precise or exact figures. That was the first correction that you wanted to make. I, I thought you wanted to make another correction as well, Mr. Opperman. Correctly so, um, sir. Uh, point number 16 on my statement, which is page number 3, refers to Eskom imposing penalties based on the supply of non-conforming coal. Um, and I think maybe... I'm sorry, let me just get there. What, what paragraph, what page? Page number 3, uh -huh. point number 16. Paragraph 16. That's correct. Of at page three of your statement. That's correct. Okay. All right. What should we change there? 
Okay, it currently reads that Eskim imposed penalties based on the supply of non-confirming coal. I need to clarify this, that these penalties were not imposed in 28 and 29, but they were recorded, and it was not for non-conforming coal, but it was for undersupply. For undersupply. Correct. So, um, the first sentence should read, Eskom imp imposed penalties based on the undersupply of coal. Is that what it should read? I would prefer if we say that Eskom uh, recorded penalties. Oh, okay. That's cool. So imposed becomes recorded. Correct. Recorded penalties based on the undersupply of coal. Correct. Based on the. <coughs> of coal. Okay, I've got that. Is there another correction you want to make in the statement? No, that's all. Thank you, that's sir. That's all. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Opperman, uh, the second part of the formalities I'd like to deal with is your confirmation that you are currently employed at ESCOM. That's correct. Um, you confirm in your statement that you have a long history of employment at ESCOM and that you started at ESCOM fairly early. When did you start at ESCOM? I started in ESCOM um, in 1992 as a bursarer, but I was appointed in ESCOM on 1 February 1996 as a plant operator at Kendall Power Station. At Kendall? Correct. All right. And you rose through the ranks to become a plant manager? That's correct. When was it? Um, it was around 2007, 2008. And which, which plant were you managing at the time? It was uh, the auxiliary plant areas, looking after all the material handling components on the power station. Was it still at Kendall? Correct. Okay. You then mentioned that at some point you um, moved to uh, Henrina power station. No, that is not correct. Um, right. I was responsible for the management of coal supply to Indrina, but I never worked at Indrina physically. That was in my capacity uh, that I'm appointed currently as uh, in the primary energy division. Oh, I see. I misunderstood your statement then. So you say you worked in the primary energy division of ESCOM? Correct. As what? As the coal supply unit manager, the same position that I still occupy. And in that position, what do you do in relation to the various power stations owned by ESCOM? Um, we are a team of individuals that is allocated to certain power stations. Um, so for most of the close to 10 years that I worked as a coal supply unit manager, I have managed uh, between one and two stations at, at power stations at a time. So my responsibility as to, towards that station is to make sure that the coal supply that they get confirms to their requirements at the power station and is also delivered as cost effectively as possible. Can you mention those power stations by name? that you were responsible for? Yes, it was Majuba Power Station, Kumati Power Station, Indrina Power Station, and Arnott Power Station. And at no particular time, all four of them, um, it has just happened that it was at certain times two of the stations, but those were the four that, four that I was responsible for. The two power stations that you must have managed that I'll deal with in detail in the course of your evidence are uh, Hendrina and Arnold. In relation to Hendrina, when did you begin your management responsibilities, particularly insofar as they relate to the management of coal supply? I can't recall the exact date, but it must have been around September 2012 when I started managing the optimum contract. Yes. 
And my understanding is that Hendrina procured coal from Optimum Coal Mine. Correct. So that your commencement of the management responsibilities would have coincided with the appointment of Mr. Clifton Efron as the Chief Executive Officer of Optimum Coal Holdings, which at the time owned Optimum Coal Mine. Do you know Mr. Clifton Efron? I do know him, yes. Have you come across him in the course of your functions and duties? Yes. All right. Chair, we will get to the interface between the two of them in due course. Okay. And in relation to Arnold, when did you commence your management functions and duties? I cannot recall that date. Um, More I, or less? I, I do remember that I uh, was responsible for the management to the supply to Arnold Power Station at the time when um, the coal was contracted from the Geta in January 2016. 2016? Yes, yeah. So by that time I was there already. We will get to how Tegeta was contracted to supply coal to Arnold, and we'll do so in detail. But from your perspective, and from the moment you became involved in the management of coal supply from Tegeta, can you give us a snapshot of how Tegeta supplied coal to Arnold Power Station? We'll get to the details, but just to give us some snapshot of how the relationship worked? Um, the coal supply started with a short-term agreement um, initially. I think it was for a once-off volume of 100,000 tons, which was then extended with a three-month contract and again extended with a five-month contract. Um, at that moment in time, the Geta um, procured the coal from the optimum operation and um, sold it to Eskom, but the contracting party was with the Geta, not with Glencore at that moment. Yes. I have read your statement, and it becomes clear when one reads it that there was not a long-term supply coal agreement, which before the chairperson have often been described as the coal supply agreement. In other words, there was no long-term coal supply between Eskom and Geta for the supply of coal to Arnold Power Station, correct? That's correct. Yes. Uh, do you know anything about Brockfontein, which was uh, supplying coal to ESCOM? I know of Brockfontein very well. I managed that contract from inception until uh, it went into business rescue also in February 2018. Yes. Chair, Ms. Hoffman will deal with the evidence of Mr. Opperman insofar as it relates to, to Brockfontein. Brockfontein. Yes. Okay. She has assumed the title of responsibility in relation to that contract involving Tegeta. Yes, I, I see it's quite, seems to be quite a nice division of work. Yes, Chair. <laughs> uh, I wonder how you are able to cope with so much files, so much information, when we have divided our team, our team across different topics. Well, it's because of your assistance. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Opperman, can I then take you back to your statement in the context of what you have just told us about your management responsibilities? I'd like to highlight some of them, beginning from page one of your statement, paragraph four. I'm going to skip paragraphs one to three, but you are welcome to deal with them if you think that I have omitted something of significance to your evidence. Are you there? I'm there. Are you happy that we should go to paragraph four? Hundred percent. Yes. Now, I'd like to highlight some of these functions and duties. And the first that I'd like to pick up is from the first bullet point. You say part of your duties is to determine and get approval for short, medium, and long-term coal supply. First thing first, what period do you describe as a short-term supply? Um, Short-term will be uh, a supply over three months, typically, something like that. So anything less than three months would be short-term? Yeah, it, it could even go up to five months, but I won't say it's less than a year. Okay. And then what do you 
cover in that medium term period? How should we understand it in terms of months? Uh, medium term uh, contracts is anything from a year um, and we have had medium term contracts for even up as long as 10 years. As 10 years. So anything from one year to 10 years would be medium term, correct? Correct. It is not clearly defined like that, but I think if one needs to put a timeline to it, that is more. Oh, yeah. Now we're working with your experience yes. uh, because you are the one who describe your responsibilities in that way. I'm um, not suggesting that there is a rule book. We're just working from your experience. And long-term supply would be generally the CSA that we have looked at. Yeah, we do get uh, CSAs for medium-term contracts as well. So the medium-term contracts also does have a CA CSA. And equally so the short-term contracts as well. But the long-term contracts will typically exceed 10 years. So that could be something as long as 20 years or 30 years. Yes. The one that we have the longest period for is a 30 years contract uh, relating to Henrina. Yeah, if I, I think if it's correct, it's going for 35 years now. Yes. And then you say that in regards to those periods type of supplier contracts, you have to get approval. Where do you get the approval from? This function um, that is part of my portfolio um, in terms of approval um, is facilitated by the fuel sourcing department. Um, so we've got a department in our division uh, which is termed fuel sourcing um, and they will negotiate and facilitate the process of getting approval. So my function in this regard is to make sure that coal supply agreement is approved by the time that it reads our desk to execute it, or yes. my desk to execute yes. it. Chair, you've heard the evidence of Mr. Nagar, I'm going to repeat it. But I'd just like you, Mr. Yes. Opperman, to inform us about your role in that approval process. What do you do to get that approval? As, as, as the coal supply manager of these power stations, what, what do you do? What physically do you do in order to facilitate that approval process? Um, I can't really say how we are, how I am involved in the approval of it other than assisting the fuel sourcing department with technical support or contract management experience through that facilitation process. But the submissions that will go to the various authorizing committees that gets compiled uh, by the fuel sourcing division or department, um, and occasionally we will have inputs into it, into it uh, bringing our experience to the table. I suppose what I want to establish from you is this, that there will always be a need identified by a power station about its requirements relating to coal supply, correct? That, that need for coal supply will actually be identified through our integrated planning department, yes. which is also one of the departments within the primary energy division. So that department is responsible to look at the burn requirement of the coal within the fleet and they will then, based on that, determine the shortage of coal at a specific power station. Um, and based on that, um, that need will arise. Yes. Uh, do you play any role in the identification of the need? Not, not really. Not really. All right. And once the need has been identified and quantified, then there will be a process for giving effect to it through a process of um, either procurement of coal from different coal suppliers or through some short-term agreements, correct? That's correct. Do you play any role in the process? Uh, to give effect to the agreement? To give effect to the procurement before the agreement? No, I don't play any role. Either. All right. And once the formal procurement process have been completed, there will be an execution of an agreement between ESCOM and a supplier. That's correct. Do you play any role in that regard? No, nothing. Well, look at what you say in the second bullet point. You say that one of your responsibilities is to manage commercial and legal aspe aspect aspects of existing, existing coal supply agreements. 
That is correct. So um, in an existing coal supply agreement, meaning um, it went through the procurement process, it has been signed by all parties and it's in execution phase, um, commercial aspects might include or will include uh, payments for goods delivered, coal delivered, and legal aspects will typically be when there is aspects that needs to be interpreted in the contract and I will liaise with the legal team on those. Yes. Uh, that's a shorthand for compliance obligations by suppliers Correct. and ESCOM. And that's a heavy responsibility because often than not, there is always a continuing dispute between ESCOM and its suppliers relating to coal quality and coal quantity supply issues. Correct? That uh, does happen, yes. yes. Just take us through what happens on the ground about how these disputes arise and how do you yourself become involved in trying to resolve these disputes? I think one need to, to narrow down on a certain aspect, uh, be it either on quantity or on quality, those disputes. So um, let's, let's deal with the quantity one, which is maybe the easier one. So a coal supply agreement will have provisions on how um, the quantity in the coal supply agreement needs to be managed. Um, we term it in the contract, when one looks at the quantity tables, there is a nominal minimum and maximum. So it gives you an opportunity to do some phasing with volumes, um, mainly to compensate for seasonal changes, but also to accommodate challenges, be it at the power station or in the mining, mining section. Um, certain contracts have provisions for a undersupply, um, I think most of the contracts have a provision for undersupply. Um, these undersupply provisions in the contracts is very harsh. Um, uh, it's a very harsh penalty. Um, and that's the way that we deal with it. So the moment that um, the supplier will deliver less than minimum, so you will have the contracted nominal when it goes below minimum for a certain period, depending on what's uh, noted in the contract, um, a request for a rectification plan will be submitted. Um, that is an official request to, to provide a plan on how it will be recovered. Um, within fairness, that, that plan needs to be considered and ultimately we, we are in the business of buying the coal. That is what we need. Um, so we will liaise with a, with a supplier and see how can we get around to, to actually get those volumes to materialize. Um, Failing which the short supply penalty will then be applied. Yes. You've given us uh, a bit of detail there. I'd like to understand where do you fit in in that detail, you as Mr. Opperman? I fit in all that, in that whole area. That is my responsibility. So you manage that whole scheme of detecting short supply and imposition of penalties arising from short supply. That's correct. So, so um, I will be the person that will be able to identify if there is a, a short supply. From that short supply, my finance team will assist me with a calculation of a short supply penalty if it goes to that point. I will be the person that will issue the request for rectification plan to, to the res, uh, respective supplier to engage them on a recovery plan. Yes. And the same thing will be the case, and it will be our responsibilities when it comes to coal quality supply concerns that require imposition of penalty by ESCOM. In other words, you will play the same role. I, I do play the same role. However, on coal qualities, um, there is a process, a dispute process that can be followed. So the moment that qualities is out of specification, there is a process that you can go through disputing those qualities, um, which is again dependent on the method of contracting. Um, and then after that qualities has been disputed and the results becomes available, that results then becomes final and binding. If that uh, qualities then still requires a penalty to be imposed, I will be responsible for the imposition of that penalty and the penalty will be calculated with the support from the finance team. Indeed. So you take responsibility for identifying the nature and extent of coal quality problems, and you take responsibility for the calculation of penalties that ESCOM will impose. And understand that although you yourself may not do the mathematics, 
you take final responsibility for the numbers arising from the mathematics. I think that is fair to say that. Um, there is teams available or supporting me on the technical point as well, on the quality determination, but that, that's a fair deduction. Yes, I understand. There will be, uh, what do you call, call scientists from ESCOM who would go through the call quality problems. Uh, there may well be even your finance division who look at the numbers and come to you with some, some number and you agree to implement the number. That's correct. Yes. Other than yourself, doing all of those things uh, relating to the two mines that you manage, and we know that one of them is uh, Optimum Coal Mine, would there be any other person who would do the calculations relating to penalties? Um, yes, uh, we, we have had an incident, ex uh, especially on the Optimum Coal Supply Agreement, where there was a lot of uh, contention around the way that the calculation need to be done, we, um, we've consult or I've consulted our internal legal people and we then uh, consulted external legal firms to assist us with the calculation of penalties as well as the interpretation thereof. Yes. Mr. Opperman, let me give you some indication of why I've asked you these questions and your responsibilities. The chairperson has said a lot about the calculation and imposition of penalties relating to optimum coal mine, which ultimately led to the declaration of hardship and business rescue of optimum coal mine Petroy Limited. You are aware of that history, correct? Correct. And ultimately, the amount that was sought to be imposed in the beginning, I'm talking about June 2015, was in the order of 2.5 billion. Are you aware of that amount? It was in that order, yes. yes. And finally, when Optimum Coal Mine was taken over by Tegeta, the amount reduced to 255 million cash payment. Are you aware of that history? I am aware of that um, settlement amount. Yes. Those are the two points of the penalties. In your statement, you make it quite clear that you disagreed with the first leg of the penalties. We'll get to, to that part of your evidence. But you confirm for now that you disagreed with the calculation of the penalties of 2.1 billion rand, correct? I, I did not disagree with the calculation. I fully agree with the 2.1 billion. Um, what is important is to understand the different reference points. Yes. Um, and if I'm afforded the opportunity, I will explain. Yes. It. But I, I'm sorry. Uh, I take it that uh, what you mean is you arrive at the same outcome. Correct. Total, but the methods or the means by which you arrive at it might differ uh, in some way from the method that may have been used by those who calculated uh, um, and came to the same amount, 2.1 uh, billion. Is that right? Gee, there's not a different uh, interpretation. I think even yes. the interpretation is the same because we work yes. from the same spreadsheet. So yes. there's no uh, difference in that. Um, I think uh, Mr. Maleka refers to um, the 720 million that I uh, referred to in my um, statement. And uh, my statement to the 720 million only included the sizing penalty up until end of April, um, I think 2013, when Optimum issued a notice where they wanted to renegotiate the sizing penalty. Whereas the 2.1 billion penalty considers the sizing penalty for the whole period. Okay, no, that's fine. We'll get to the details and how the calculation was done, but as far as you are aware, you came to the conclusion that a justifiable amount of the penalties that ESCOM could lawfully impose on your interpretation of the agreement was in the order of 720 million. 
that that deduction that I made, as I said, um, was only for the for the period considering the sizing penalty up until 23 April 2013. I understand. So so I only considered in my statement I only considered the sizing penalty up until the period when Optimum came to the table and they said to us. Eskom, we want to renegotiate the sizing specification. Yes. They are entitled, according to the first addendum, to, to request that to be done. There's a whole process that followed after that with multiple communications up and down for additional information, and it never got to, to agreeing to a different sizing specification, but that was my interpretation. So yes. the whole time when, when I was referencing a penalty against this contract, it considered the quality parameters, it excluded AI because the AI was levied at that moment in any case, but it only included the sizing penalty up until April 2013. Up until April 2013. That's and correct. on that calculation, you came to that number of 720 quad million rand, correct? Yeah, there was some interpretation done to it, and, yeah. and uh, me not being a mathematician, but uh, use some averages and... Yes and things like that, and, and I got to the 723. Um, I, I did a similar calculation on Mr. Nagar's spreadsheet, and yes. on that spreadsheet it came to 719 million, so the 720 ballpark figure is there. And, and that's really the point of the questions, that you do one calculation, given your role and official responsibilities in ESCOM, you arrive at one figure. Someone else does a calculation, arrive at a totally different figure. I would like you, when we get to that point of evidence, to give some explanation of the differences, if any. Do yeah, I don't, I don't think there has been any difference. Okay. I, I'm confirming that it was the same figure. It was the same figure. Good. Okay, thank you. Then can I take you back to your statement and reflect on some of the responsibilities that you outline on page two? You say, and I'm reading from the second bullet point at the top of page two, that you manage call quality in terms of the CSA, correct? That's correct. And so if the debates around call quality issues, that will be your management responsibility? That's correct. All right. And then in the fourth bullet point from the top, you say you also identify and manage call supply and cost risk. Can I ask you to explain to us precisely what do you do in that regard? And I'm interested in the management of the cost risk. So what we will do is, um, in certain instances, when coal gets delivered not via conveyor, where it's a fixed mode of delivery, but coal gets delivered by a road, um, we will consider that coal supply risk in that manner. Um, in terms of considering different routes that a vehicle can take, the shorter the route, the lower the rand per ton that we pay for the logistics cost. Um, it could be that. Um, I, I immediately can't think really of anything else. Okay. And to reorientate you on the facts in this case relating to that official responsibility, you are aware that coal supplied to Arnott from Optimum Coal Mine by Tegeta was transported by road. That's correct. And that would have been part and parcel of managing that risk of delivery from Optimum Coal Mine to Arnott. That's correct. From your memory uh, or experience, what is the distance between Optimum coal mine and Arnott power station. Um, I can't recall, but it must be in the region of around 60, 64 kilometers, somewhere around there. Yes. And so ESCOM would pay not only for the actual price of the coal per ton, but it will also pay transport costs. That's correct. Yes. Are you able to recall offhand what would have been the average of the transport costs relating to the short-term supply agreement between Tegeta and ESCOM to supply coal to Arnott? 
Um, I cannot recall, uh, um, you are referring to the rent per ton for the transportation? Yes. I cannot recall exact figures, but it must be in the region, if I think around 140 rand or so. All right. Um, the next responsibility I'd like you to explain to us is, I think, the fifth from the bottom, where you say you manage CSA accounts. Do you see that? Yes. What do you do in that regard? Sorry, can I just, can you just repeat it? Um, do you see the fifth bullet point from the bottom on page two of your statement? Okay, yes, yeah. You say part of your responsibilities include the management of coal supply agreement accounts. Correct. Yes. Would that be invoices from the suppliers? That's correct, yes. And if there are queries, you will query them? That's correct. And I suppose if there are no queries, you will certify them for payment? That's correct. And the last responsibility I'd like you to explain for us is the one that follows thereafter. You say you liaise with power station management, internal supply, personal, personnel, other ESCOM clients and industry committees. Do you see that? That's correct. Yes. In so far as liaison with the power station management is concerned, can you explain to us what do you do? Uh, we will have monthly liaison meetings with the power station coal management team. Um, it will occasionally also be attended by the general manager or the coal supply mani uh, the coal um, the coal supply unit manager. Um, and the function of that is to really report on the previous month's performance and look at supply risk, try and align um, the burn requirements with the supply risk from the power station. We will also revisit qualities. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what we do. So that if there are problems in relation to the power stations in, uh, regarding their requirements, you will be someone who is informed about them and you will be someone who would be able to deal with them. In general terms? Yeah, I will be informed with it, uh, about it, and uh, will action it. Yes. And in so far as your interface with ESCOM's clients and industry committees are concerned, what do you do? Who are these clients? More or less. Just categorization of them quite quickly. In, in this aspect, ESCOM clients is referred to as our suppliers. Um, so I also have monthly engagements with the suppliers where we will meet um, and uh, look at supply risks, uh, quality risk. We will discuss um, any operational matters, uh, potential coal supply issues, uh, things like that. Um, so it's mainly on that. Um, industry committees uh, will include, on occasion, if we... Um, involve people that are specialists for argument in, on sampling or coal accounting, uh, things like that. All right, so is it fair if we were to strike out that word clients and replace it with suppliers? Yeah, that's fair. Okay. We have now... Uh, is that the... Is that what comes after the bullet point with lies with power station? Yes, Chair. After ESCOM? Yes, after okay. ESCOM, then clients... Uh, should be suppliers. Indeed. Okay, thank you. Because ESCOM's clients would generally be municipalities and uh, consumers of uh, electricity. Uh, Mr. Opperman? Yes. Okay. All right, we, we have an appreciation of your roles and responsibilities. And you confirm in paragraph five that you report to Mr. Petros Mazibuko, who is the general manager of coal operations, correct? That's correct. And all of these reporting lines are within the primary energy division of ESCOM? That's correct. Okay. 
And Mr. Masheko leads that division, as I recall. That's correct. Yes. Now, in paragraph six, you explain the nature and extent of the evidence you have conversed in your statement. I'm not going to deal with it uh, unless you want to reflect on any part of it. Uh, for my part, I confirm that I'm interested in your evidence insofar as it relates to Hendrina Power Station and Arnold Power Station. And you have explained when you started your management responsibilities in relation to the two. Unless there's anything that you would like to raise, I will skip that paragraph and go to paragraph 9. You mentioned the name of Mr. George van der Merve, who was the chief operating officer of Optimum Coal Mine. Do you see that? That's it. Yes. Uh, the chairperson has not heard the evidence of Mr. Uh, van der Merve, who is the COO of that mine, but has heard the evidence of Mr. Efron. And Mr. Efron mentioned your name in the context of negotiations that followed the cooperation agreement, that you were part and parcel of the negotiation team for ESCOM. Do you confirm that? Yes. Did Mr. Van der Merwe take part in those negotiations as far as you are aware? No, Mr. Van der Merwe did not. Uh, Mr. Van der Merwe was the Chief Operating Officer for Optimum Coal Mine under the management and control of Tegeta. Of Tegeta? Correct. Oh, I see. All right. I um, was a bit confused. Now, can I take you to page three of your statement? Under the heading Background to Hendrina, you give us some historical detail. Most of that has been dealt with by other witnesses. I'll move quite quickly through the paragraphs if you don't mind. But again, the qualification is that if you want to say something more, please do. I'm at paragraph 11, and you confirm that that mine um, that is the mine which was supplying Hendrina. It began on a specific pricing structure. It was a cost plus mine supply structure. Do you confirm that? That's correct. Do you know when it changed? It changed in 1993 with the signing of the uh, next agreement. Yes. And it became a fixed price uh, type of structure for the supply of coal. That's correct. Okay. Chair, I think they've explained the difference to you. I'm not going to ask Mr. Yes. Opperman to deal with the differences. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Opperman, you explain in paragraph 15 something relating to the coal quality that was procured from optimum coal mine. Do you see that? Yes. You will say that the coal sold and delivered to ESCOM by optimum coal mine had excessively high abrasive index. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Chair, you have heard enough of the evidence about what abrasive index is. I'm not going to... Will everybody please switch off their cell phones? Okay. Yes, Ms. Malaga. Thank you, Chair. I think we have a fair understanding, Mr. Opperman, of what a abrasive index is. So you can assume that we understand something about what it means. But what I'd like you to explain to us is what is, an, what is the typical implication to the operation of the mine, sorry, the power station, when coal has this high abrasive index, how does it affect the power station? So the abrasive index um, in coal that we measure is a determination of um, 
a certain chemical characteristic that that coal has that impacts wear um, and wear rates. So what typically will happen with a coal with a high wear rate, wherever it gets into contact um, with any metal surface, it will wear away that metal surface. So this will typically impact the areas of, of your milling plant, um, the classifier plant, your PF ductings, your pulverized fuel ductings that, that uh, feeds the coal to the furnace, the burner, the burner mouths, the burners that goes into the, into the furnace. And then what also happens is that the moment that this coal is then combusted, it also has an impact on the ash characteristics with relevant to the pyrites um, and those chemical substances in the ash that then also have a wear impact on the boiler tubing, uh, flue, gas, flue gas ducts, the air eaters in that stream, um, even out on your ID fan impellers. Um, so basically everything that gets into contact with that, that stream of coal or ash gas stream once it is combusted. So it is an indication um, of a impact on wear on plant. So the higher the figure, the higher your wear rate will be. Yes. So the higher the abrasive index, the greater and faster the wear and tear of the various parts of the power station takes place. Correct. Relating to the areas that has contact to the coal. Indeed. Correct. So as the coal with high abrasive index moves through various parts during the combustion process, those parts wear quickly. That's correct. And there's a need for maintenance or That's replacement. Correct. That's correct. And that's the reason why you impose penalties. That's correct. Okay. Now I understand. I'm going to get to that issue of the abrasive index with reference to an arbitration and settlement agreement that ESCOM had with Optimum Coal Mine. And you are aware of it? Yes, I am. We'll get to that issue later on because the questions of penalties there. You remember that? That's correct. All right. Now, you have already dealt with paragraph 16, and you have indicated how we should read it. And in its current form, it says, ESCOM recorded penalties based on the undersupply of coal. And you say OCM disputed the penalties imposed by ESCOM, and the dispute was referred to arbitration. You see that? Yes. And you say ultimately there was a settlement agreement, and you refer to the settlement agreement in paragraph 17. Do you confirm that? Yes, that's correct. I'd like to take you to the settlement agreement, if you don't mind. It is from page 171 of U8. Are you there, Mr. Opperman? Yes. Yes. You will see that the heading of the document is Settlement of Arbitration and Second Addendum to the Hendrina Coal Supply Agreement. Do you see that? Yes. So that uh, the purpose of that settlement was not only to settle the dispute relating to the short supply of coal by Hendrina at that point in time, but also to amend the CSA via the second addendum. Do you agree with that interpretation? Yes. Okay. Now let's look at clause 1.3 on page 173. 
that clause is a definition clause, making it quite clear that the document we're looking at, it's a second amendment to the CSA, and that's why it's called the second addendum, correct? That's correct. Now, you will see that paragraph 2.2 .2 on page 174 records the history given rise to the second addendum and the amendment to the CSA begin at paragraph 3.1. Do you confirm that? Yes. The first amendment related to the coal quantity. So there is an amount of 5.5 million per ton of coal that Optimum Coal Mine agreed to deliver to ESCOM. Mr. Efron explained to the chairperson the implication of that amendment. And I don't want to take you through it, but my recollection is that it was changing the maximum amount that was initially delivered under the CSA. Do you agree with that? That's correct. It was previously 6.5. Yes. So there was a reduction of the amount. And the obvious implication of it is that Optimum Coal Mine was quite satisfied that it could not deliver the previous maximum and therefore it did not want to incur penalties relating to short supply. Correct. Yes. Then the next amendment of importance to your evidence um, begin from page 178. I have skipped the rest, but it's up to you if you want to bring our attention to other parts of the second addendum. Oh, that's fine. It's paragraph 3.3. .3. It talks about the topic of abrasive index. Do you see that? Yes. And the amendments are now set out in detail in paragraph 3.3.2. .3 Do you see that? Yes. Now, can I ask you to take us quickly, if you can, through these amendments? Because there is a step letter like calculation of the abrasive index and the penalties depending on the degree of the calculated indices. Do you see that? Yes. Can I please ask you to explain to us how the penalty model will work under the second addendum? Okay, so, so I want to take you back to paragraph 3.31 just bef the paragraph just before that, yes, um, because there's something of importance to note, and it's the last section of that paragraph that clarifies the method or the manner in what in how these qualities will be determined. So it, it says there that the target is to have AI less than 423 milligram iron on a seven-day weighted rolling average basis. Okay, so this is important yes. when we talk lot later about penalty determination. So, so this is the first time that the qualities uh, on AI gets raised and it clarifies the, the, the method in how it will be calculated and it is calculated on a seven-day weighted rolling average basis. Yes. Okay. So you look not only on a stockpile per day, you look at an average of the stockpiles over a period of seven days. You look at it at over a period of seven days. It is rolling, so the seven days will consistently roll, so that's correct. But you will also weight it according to the deliveries on that specific day. Yes. Okay. Uh, for some of us who don't understand how weighted average work, can you explain to us how do you do your weighting? during this period of seven days. Okay, so, so what you will do during the period of seven days, you will take the total tons uh, supplied over the seven days, and you will take the tons that was supplied on that specific day. That will be worked out as a percentage uh, to one another, and you will multiply the AI on that specific day with that weighting, and that will roll 
the whole time. So the important here is to understand that it's weighted, firstly, yes. and the second one is that it is not a seven-day window, but it is a rolling average. Oh. So it, it, it does become quite a complex calculation when one does this. All right. But we know that the importance or the objective of that calculation is to make sure that the index is less than four, two, three. That's correct. If it's more, the calculations of penalties begin. That's correct. Okay. And, Just, uh, and that takes us to point number 332, so I can explain that. Yes. So, so what you find here um, is that there is five ranges. So the contract stipulates that it should be below 423 to not attract any penalties. The moment that it is greater than 423 but less than 500 or up to 500, the optimum will pay a penalty of 1 rand 23 per ton. So where I get to this optimum pay a penalty, it's described just in the paragraph above where it says, um, in the event that the AI, AI level is greater than 423 milligram iron, optimum coal colliery will be liable to pay a penalty is calculate based on the following basis. Yes. So what it will mean is that optimum will invoice us and then they will pay that. So, so what we have done in, in reality is that this penalty on a monthly basis where it was applicable, this penalty was offset against the invoice amount on a monthly basis. Okay, and so it goes uh, can on. I, can I stop you there? Yes. I think it's important to make sure that uh, your evidence is understood by us. You say that if there is a need to impose penalties, then the penalties will be calculated and it will be levied on a monthly basis. Correct. And the process of levying that penalty is you will do a set off against invoices. For that specific month, yes. Yes. So, and that's important. And I'd like to make sure that your evidence is clear on that score. So every month, Optimum will send out an invoice for the stockpile delivered. And you will look at it and you'll say, but they are liable to pay a penalty. You do your calculation and you'll set off the amount of the calculated penalties against the invoices. And you'll pay the net between the invoiced amount and the penalty amount. That's correct. And you say you do it on a, base, on a monthly basis? Correct. Yes. Before you actually do the, or effect the set-off, would you have uh, communicated to them your conclusion that penalties uh, have to be imposed, or they would only see when they see how much you are paying them that month? Uh, Chair, the, there will be a, a remittance advice submitted by the finance department to the mine, so they will become aware through that before the payment is effected. Um, at a later state in the main management of the contract, we have, I have started drafting a letter which was um, a letter formatted by Cliff Decker and Hofmeyer where they advised us how to um, share this detail on a monthly basis and this letter made reference to the coal price at the time, the total invoiced amount, uh, the amount deductible for coal quality, CVS, volatile, sizing, and then also the AI. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Chair, I'm going to skip the rest because we can see how the amount increases uh, as the AI uh, goes up. Uh, unless uh, you want to make any comment on it. But what I'd like to take you to, of relevance to the penalty, is paragraph 3.3.3. .3. Do you see it? Yes. Can you, I ask you what is the implication of that paragraph to the penalties ESCOM would be entitled to impose? So, Chair, the... These amounts, the, and if we just take the first range, the 123 per ton that is payable by optimum for AI between 423 and 500, this 123 was as on the base date 1 April 2011, and this amount of 123 will then be adjusted 
with the escalation matrix in this contract on an annual basis as the escalation happened. So it's possible that although the baseline for calculation is one rent 23 cents per ton, that rent amount may be escalated higher depending on the methodology set out in the uh, CSA. That's correct. Yes. Now, Mr. Opperman, I'm going to take you to paragraph 3.4.3 on page 179. And it talks to the question that the chairperson has posed to you. On my reading of that paragraph, it is quite clear that there's an obligation for ESCOM to advise Optimum Colliery on a month-to-month -month basis about the nature and extent of the penalties it intends to impose, correct? That's correct. And you do so with reference to providing details, including the calculation of those penalties, correct? Correct including the laboratory tests that you have at your disposal concerning the levels of the AI that you may have picked up from the stockpile supplied. Correct? That's correct. It's an elaborate process. Uh, and it seems to me that you are at the front line of making sure that this process is complied with. Correct? Correct. Given this elaborate process and the need for a monthly imposition, sorry, firstly, monthly calculation and monthly communication of the fines imposed to the relevant mine, why would there be a debate in due course as between optimum and ESCOM about these penalties. Because it seems to me that this clause is designed to anticipate those debates and resolve them as and when they happen. Do you agree? I agree. But why would then be such a historical debate of two years worth of penalties in the light of this metrics of dispute resolution? Throughout this, this contract, there has been various attempts in terms of the interpretation of the penalty provisions of this contract. Um, and I think this was just, a, again, one other example where the parties failed to agree on the method of calculation of this penalty. And that is why there was, why there was that um, discontent around the penalty amount. Um, and, and there has been a lot of engagements around it with Lencor on frequent basis where calculations were shared. The laboratory results is shared in real time on a daily basis. So that is something that is available to either party at any given time. Um, the calculations were shared at intervals. I would not say that it was consistently shared every month, but if you draw up a spreadsheet and you say, well, this is the way that we calculate it, then it implies every month you just plug in the actual quality parameter that's relevant to that seven-day rolling period, and it should yield the result. But yes, yet there was a difference of interpretation around this calculation. And uh, <clears throat> when, the, when you have advised, when you would have advised them of the imposition of a penalty in a particular month and they didn't agree with you and therefore there was some issue, would you go ahead and uh, effect the set off in regard to that month or would uh, the implementation of the set off wait to wait until there is some resolution in regard to that particular month? Chairperson, on, on the AI, we did offset that amount every month, irrespective and of the... Yes, of, of a dispute. Of a dispute, yes. So the dispute could be 
handled in due course, but you would have effected that set off in the meantime. Correct. We yeah. we felt from Eskom that the second addendum was very clear on how the AI should be calculated, um, and that amount was deducted every month. Reason being that the month that that AI was high, we incurred the additional wear at our power plant, and that was a material cost, and that was all determined through a research study that informed these penalty parameters in the second addendum. I, I guess it follows that if you had effected a set off in a particular month, uh, but a dispute arose or was still going on, and later on you were persuaded that you were wrong, you would then reverse that. We could do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Th thank you, Chair. Um, uh, there are two other additional points I'd like to draw your attention to relating to this second addendum. Uh, the first is at page 179, paragraph 3.5.1. Do you see that? Yes, sir. It's about the base price for the coal supplied or to be supplied. You see that it changes now to become 115, 115 rand per ton. That's correct. Yes. And it will begin from 11 April 2011, correct? No, it only uh, meant that this is the base price for that specific date and that the escalation will be made on the indices from that date going forward. Yes, now I understand that from that date going forward, you will obviously apply whatever escalation. Correct. But that's the base price. All right. The next part relates to paragraph 3.6.1 and it's going to become important as we explore your evidence in two ways. Firstly, it seems to me when I read this clause and others that support the philosophy of it, that the parties who were well aware and were concerned about the abrasive index of the coal stock from that mine, from optimum coal mine, and they wanted to do their best efforts to see what were the reasons for it and how they can resolve it. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. And the parties committed themselves to how they will deal with it. In fact, they formed a steering committee, correct? That's correct. Yes. Were you part of it or were you not there at the time? No, I was not there at the time. I only started managing this contract in September the following year, yes. 2012. From anecdotal evidence you could have obtained, do you know whether the process to investigate this problem about coal from Optimum was taken further as between the parties? I do recall that um, there was a study done by an independent uh, expert company. Um, in short, I can just refer it to the Turgis study. Um, I am not exactly sure over what period it fell, but I would like to believe that it coincided with the actions from the STIRCOM where it was done. Okay. Chair, I'm going to leave paragraph 4.1 4.1 and 4.2 on page 181 because it will become relevant when we deal with the third addendum. So may I ask yes. you to note that there is still that part of 4.1 and 4.2 but it becomes relevant when we deal with the third addendum. And the last part, so Mr. Um, Opperman, is the lawyer's clause where the parties agreed to abandon whatever disputes or contentions they may have had, and that is paragraph 6.1. You see that? Yes. Yeah, okay. Subject to any other issue you would like to bring to our attention, I'd like to go back to your statement and pick up your evidence from paragraph 18. Are you there? Page four, paragraph 18 of your statement. I'm there. Yeah. 
you talk about the fact that Glencore acquired Optimum in 2012, correct? Yes. And as a result of that acquisition, the parties signed uh, a third addendum, correct? Correct. And you say the purpose of the third addendum was to delete paragraphs 4.1 and 4.2 of the second addendum, correct? Correct. Chair, is in that context, and it was for that reason that I skipped paragraphs 4.1 and 4.2 of the second addendum. Yes, yes. If you don't mind, I'd like to go back to it to see yes. precisely what is the effect of the third addendum on those two paragraphs of the second addendum. Chair, you'll Thank find you. the third addendum on... Was it 131? Uh, or not really? No, I think it comes after 171. It will be at 187. It begins from page 188. Do you see that? Ms. Opperman, are you at page 188? Yes. Okay. Can you confirm that that is the third addendum that you referred to in paragraph 18 of your statement? Yes, it is. Yes. You see that it was signed by Mr. or Ms. Karen Maharaj on the 11th of February 2013 on behalf of ESCOM, if you go to page 190, correct? That's correct. Do you know who signed it on behalf of Optimum Coal Holdings and Optimum Coal Mine P2I Limited? It seems to be the same signature. I think it's Mr. Efron's signature, okay. but I'm under correction. Yes. Seems to be Mr. Efron, Clinton Efron. Efron, okay, thank you. The substance of the third addendum, you will find it on page 189. Do you see that? Yes. And paragraph 3.1.1, can you read it for us? The parties hereby amend the second addendum by deleting the provisions of clauses 4.1 and 4.2 of the second addendum. Yes. So, Chair, what we did for our part is to go back to paragraphs 4.1.1, sorry, 4.1 and 4.2, which are on page 181. And we simply crossed, out crossed a amended. red line across those two clauses, Chair. Okay. Uh, I'm just making a note amended by the third addendum, is that right? Yeah, we'll say deleted, Chair. Sorry? We will suggest that you deleted. say deleted. Yes, yes, deleted, not amended, yes. deleted. In terms of 3.1.1 of the third addendum. Thank you. And the importance of this, Mr. Opperman, if you would recall, is to make sure that the original coal supply agreement, as amended by the second, so the first and second addenda, would continue to operate as the way. Correct? That's correct. Because the deleted 4.1 and 4.2 impose the obligations on the parties to relook at those clauses of the original CSA and to see how they can restate them. Do you agree? Yes, Mr. Malika. Maybe I can, I can clarify it. Um, so at this moment in time, um, one need to appreciate that 
This was a contract that was signed around 1983 that has already undergone ownership and it also has now undergone two addendums. So at this moment in time, the intention of these clauses was to consolidate the 1983 contract, the 1993 contract, the first addendum and the second addendum into one coal supply agreement and let's call it a more modern, practical, executable contract. And at this moment in time, at the signing of the third addendum, both parties have had several workshops, several engagements and attempts to achieve that, and we could not reach consensus. Yes. And hence the decision to say, we are not going to consolidate this, we will leave it as it is. That's yes. basically what the third addendum does. Yes. And the point is, you were under obligation as ESCOM Correct. to s produce to the first draft. Correct. And you did not. We could not. And no. that's the reason why these clauses were deleted. That's All good. right. So we're now operating in that world of CSA, original, first and second addendum that's at this correct, point in time. Yes. And third addendum, of course. Yes. Okay. I, I need to just make it clear. Um, we say that ESCOM did not provide a draft. It, there were several attempts to draft, to get this draft, but there was not something that both parties could agree to, to say this is a first, first draft revision that both parties could take to their legal teams and get a, a validation on it. So does that mean that uh, ESCOM did uh, produce a draft, but it was not, the two parties did not reach agreement on the draft? I don't even think it came to the compilation of a draft document, sir. Oh, okay. So, so you didn't produce yes. A, yes. a draft. Okay, I thought you <laughs> sought to <laughs> qualify that. I think, uh, Mr. <laughs> Opperman, it was a long answer to a simple question Wish which you had previously answered. Um, Mr. Opperman, you begin to tell us what problems ESCOM experienced once Glenco took over the mine. Um, you do so from paragraph 19. I am at page four of your statement. Are you at page four of your statement? Yes. In paragraph nine, you say, after the purchase of the mine by Glenco, OCM started to supply coal to Hendrina Power Station that did not meet the size specifications. Do you see that? Yes. Of course, you can talk about your knowledge of the coal quality on size from Optimum Coal Mine when you took over the management responsibility relating to Hendrina Power Station, correct? Correct. Should we read that paragraph to say that you're beginning to talk about coal quality sizing issues from the date you took over the management of Hendrina Mine? Yes, it was there and there about, although um, at that moment in time there has already been a first notice issued by the previous contract manager to Optimum, putting it on record that the size grading is out. So I'm not the first person to, drive, to yes. raise it. Yes. And you begin to issue <coughs> compliance or non-compliant notices of your own immediately after you took over management of the mine. I'd Correct. like to refer to one or two of them. And the first one is the one that you refer to in paragraph 20. Chair is Annex GJ5. You will find it from page 191, if I'm correct. Are you there, Mr. Opperman? I am. The date of that letter is 7 August 2012. Do you see that? Correct. 
And it's written by someone called H. Mukwena. That's correct. Uh, do you know that person? I know of him. Um, I don't know if I can say I know him, but yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, subject to your guidance, I'm merely going to draw your attention to the second last paragraph. Can I ask you to read it? In terms of clause 3.44 of the first addendum of the Indrina Coal Supply again, Agreement, Eskim hereby request a meeting with Optimum Coal Mine to assess the extent of our risk, as well as the plans that Optimum has implemented to reduce the minus 0.81 millimeter material delivered to Indrina Power Station. Do you know what happened after this letter was sent by Eskom? Did the meeting that is contemplated in the paragraph you have just read ever take place? I can't say. Anyway, you refer to a working group. And you say there was a report issued by that working group. Chair I am at paragraph 22 of Mr. Opperman's statement on page 4. Thank you. And you confirm in paragraph 22, Mr. Opperman, that there was a report produced by the working group. And you annex a copy of that report from page 198. Are you there? That's correct. I'm afraid I've looked at this report and I can understand precisely what it's supposed to convey because it conveys sampling results. I'm not too sure what they mean. Uh, maybe you will be able to help us on how we should approach the results recorded in this report. Does it suggest or does it not suggest that there was some solution to the coal sizing problem from Optimum Coal Mine. Are you able to help us in that regard? I, I can, sir. I can. Please do. Um, Is that the report at 198? Yes, Chair. Okay. You Thank will you. see, Chair, uh, that it gives you a background which I don't understand. Um, and on page 199, it gives you the planting, the, the sampling results through all sorts of graphs and numbers that I don't understand. Are you able to help us how we should approach this document? I can. Please do. Um. Mr. Chair, I, I for a moment just want to take you back uh, to the previous annexure, um, GJ05, and, and not the first page, but on page 193, because this is what guided this work group that was established in September on what initial action to take. So around the middle of, of uh, so, so this is an email response from Mr. Rian de Ploy, um, which at that moment in time, I think, was the chief operating officer at Optimum Mine. Um, um, so he, he responds to, to the ESCOM team following this letter, or, or following the initial email that was sent to Mr. Dagain. And uh, around the middle of that, that print, um, I'm going to start reading there, where it says, the coal from the KN, and KN abbreviation is for Quagga North, which is the mining area, Stream contains more fines than the coal from Pulenshoop. Pulenshoop was an underground operation for three primary reasons. So the first reason that gets shared there is to say that this coal comes over a conveyor belt that is 35 kilometers long and it has 18 transfer points where the coal falls from one transfer point to another transfer point. So the, the indication is to say that because of all these 
drops on, at the transfer point, this coal is breaking and it's adding to the size fraction breaking down. Now maybe at this time also, um, I need to just clarify something. Um, in the contract, we will of, often refer to the size grading as fines. So I might in my explanation talk about fines. So fines in this terminology in the contract does not refer to a punitive amount or anything, it refers to size grading. So if I do use that word, but I'll try and refrain from it. So, so the first bullet refers to that, uh, that this degradation of this coal is, is added to because of all these transfer points. The second one um, talks about the fact that this coal in the open cast is actually more friable from nature, by nature, just by the deposition that is there. And then the, the last bullet talks about the Bosman Spoort. So BMP is another underground operation, Bosman Spoort, uh, which also generates some more fines. So at the end of this explanation from Mr. Deploy, we undertook the exercise of which this report reports on where we identified the different transfer points along this conveyor, and at each transfer point, we started doing sampling to see how, what is the degradation of this coal along the way. So, so that's basically how we got to this. So uh, there was this high percentage of fines. It was abnormally high. The contract specification for this quality parameter has a limit of 15%, 1.5. And there was instances where it was as high as 30 to 35 percent. So it was double the normal. So this asked for something to be done, and, and we needed to investigate it, and this is where we started at the end of the advice from Mr. Deploy, from his experience being in the mining environment. So, so what these, what Before this... Before you proceed, Mr. Yes. Opperman, uh, if you go back to that first bullet, bullet point at page 193, where he explains how the coal gets degraded, is, is degraded, the correct word. Yes. Um, if what he was saying was correct, would that uh, have uh, meant that uh, there should be no penalty if that was correct? Not necessarily, yes. because the measuring point for this quality parameter remained at the sampling station at the power plant. Yes. But what it would have done, it would have provided some background for the origin of this high size fraction. Yes. And, and one first need to know in what area to focus in order to correct what went wrong. Yes. So at this moment in time, we saw uh, from the analysis that around April, May 2012, the size fraction started increasing and we needed to understand why. Um, there is some other okay. background as well in the top paragraph where yes. Mr. Deploy refers to a drag line that has moved to a new area, and all of that might have contributed, and he actually deals with it under point number two where he says the area where this drag line is now positioned, actually the coal is more friable. Okay, okay. Jay, can I follow up on the question that you have posed? Yes, sure. Yeah. Now, Mr. Opperman, we now have a study which explains the reasons why there is this degradation of coal quality on sizing at least. You now know the reasons, Eskom, correct? I don't understand the statements. You now have the reason, you have an explanation about this coal quality problems. Yes. You can't speculate about what the reasons are. You have established them through this study, correct? Correct. What happened after this study? Was there any improvement or did matters get worse? There was no improvement. I can't say that it got worse or that it got better, but um, the, the size specification did not come back in line with the contract specification. It yes. remained high. Um, we were not too much convinced that this test really concluded the whole exercise. Um, and what we've done after this is subsequent exercises as well where we had independent 
um, specialists for, from the industry um, to come and have a look at the sampling station because that was the next point that we needed to sit and say maybe there is a problem at the sampling station because what we also became aware of at this moment in time that was around March, April, that area, there was a modification done to the sampling system that is used to analyze the skull. So the next point was to then go to the sampler and try and identify it there. So, so this exercise that we did um, on, on the degradation of the coal, that indicates some degradation, but not to the extent to contribute to these high fines that we were seeing. So yes, it did apportion some reason, but it did not answer the full question for us. Well, can I ask you to go to page 205? Because the explanation that you give does not explain to me why Eskom wrote the letter on page 205. That letter suggests that Eskom was still concerned about the coal quality. Correct. And Eskom called upon Optimum Coal Mine at that point in time to take remedial measures. Correct. And it did not do so. No. Yes. And if I may ask you to, lead, to read the second last paragraph. The one that starts with Eskom Wishes. Yes. Eskom Wishes to place on record that this is a transgression of the, coal, of the quality specification of the first addendum of the coal supply agreement and calls upon OCM to rectify this transgression. And that letter was written by Pam Pile on the 23rd of April 2013. Do you see that? The 22nd, yes. 22nd of April 2013. And that is more or less eight or so months after you had received that email from Mr. Rian Deploy. So there was this grace period of eight months where ESCOM was told about the reasons for the degradation and ESCOM called for remedial action and Lenko did not do that. Correct. Sorry, Optimum did not do that at that point in time. Correct? Correct. Yes. Now, before we go to lunch, uh, sorry, to tea, can I ask you to see the reply of Optimum Coal Mine to that letter of Pile? Chair, you'll find the reply on page 207 and 208. Yes. I guess you, this might be the convenient time. Yes. Uh, oh, you I, wanted one last question? One last question. <laughs> okay, all right. Can you confirm that the letter beginning at page 207 is the reply by Optimum Coal Mine to the notice given by ESCOM on page 205? That's correct. In fact, it comes a day later. Correct. Yes. Chair, that will be a convenient stage to take the tea adjournment. We'll take the tea adjournment until half past 11. We adjourn.
of the coal quality sizing in terms of those clauses of the first addendum. Now, it is quite clear, and I'd like your comment on this, that at least as at April 2013, the coal coming from uh, Optimum Coal Mine was no longer suitable in terms of sizing, at least, for Hendrina Power Station. And therefore, the supplier took the view that there was a need to renegotiate questions of sizing. Do you accept that? I accept that that was OCM's view. Yes. What was ESCOM's response to OCM's view? That they were conducting operation according to best practice. They could no longer meet the specifications under the agreement and they called for a renegotiation to see whether or not new specifications can be agreed. How did you respond to that? So Mr. Chair, ESCOM responded to inform OCM that we are prepared to engage with the discussions to renegotiate um, in good faith as uh, guided in the first addendum. As part of the process, we also engaged our um, Center of Excellence, COE, which is an engineering department within Generation, um, which has materials handling specialists in that team to assist us with an assessment of the Indrina power plant, materials handling plant, in order to determine if that plant could handle the 20% minus 0.81 millimeter size fraction compared to the 15%. Um, numerous letters follows. Um, um, over the, the next couple of months, um, which, which goes to the extent where um, ESCOM requests from Optimum to provide details on their analysis as to why they say they can't meet the quality parameter. We were of the view that the exercise that was completed by the 29th of November did not conclusively provide a reason to say that is what it is. Um, so ESCOM did not agree to the increase of the sizing, although we said it is fine. We will negotiate in good faith with them. And in our view, negotiation was to say we will get technical experts to come and provide advice. We will most probably... Um, go on and do some more tests, it will be a process. So we did, not, we did not tell Optimum, we are not interested, we don't want to listen to you, we participated in the process. Um, and during this process, um, this matter has even been escalated within the ESCOM organization to my seniors. Um, so everybody was well aware of this, and I'm going to call, call it for now, perceived sizing issue at the end right now. What was the upshot of those negotiations? The, the negotiations was inconclusive. Yes. Um, in the sense that um, we, we embarked on some, some inspections by independent specialists, and that happened in November 2013, where we, we got... Um, uh, a company or a, a specialist um, in from Intertech, um, who um, this individual has vast knowledge around coal sampling, coal analysis, uh, Mr. Erasmus. Um, he did an exercise on the sampling plant. Um, we also got the, um, the OEMs, the Regional Equipment Manufacturer, which was Maltotech. That was the company that installed the sampler in around 2012, the modified sampler. We even got them out. They did an assessment on, on the 3rd of, um, of December as well. So throughout this process, we were still trying to determine what is the reason for the sizing. Um, and we, we could not get to it. it. It eventually got to a point where um, Eskom were requesting information from F uh, Optimum to be uh, made available in order to understand why they want to change the parameter and um, Optimum just never provide that, 
that information. So I think it, it just went into a stalemate. But but the the issue with the sizing persisted. So the sizing never improved. We we every month we sat and in fact at this moment in time it got to the extent where the sizing were out throughout the month. And when in our interpretation one then applies the penalty, um, this coal price were now defaulting one down to one rand a ton because of the penalty mechanism that we applied, rightly yes. or wrongly, but that is how we determined it. And, and maybe I can fast track, maybe I can fast track this to, to what happened on the 1st of October 2015, where um, uh, Mr. Jan Voges, who was a uh, Glencore employee at the time, um, I'm not 100% sure of his background, but I know he's got a, um, a very good background on uh, coal geology. Um, I don't know if he's a qualified metallurgist, but he's, he's got a vast knowledge. He was also participating in this process throughout. Um, we he identified a, a problem on the sampling plant. So this was the plant analyzing the coal, where there was a crusher that he went and switched off and immediately on the following day, there was a step change in the, si the, fine, the small size fraction reported by the sampler. Um, it, it, it did not correct itself 100%, but it significantly improved. And this for me substantiated or supported um, this whole effort that we consistently were we're putting in to try and identify what is the real issue. Because have we just admitted in the beginning that it is this coal that's friable and the transfer of the coal from Quagga North, we would have made the wrong decision. We, we would have made the wrong decision. So, um, should the chairperson approach your evidence on the basis that the sizing problem problems relating to optimum coal mine was not resolved by the parties. In fact, it continued. Correct. And I'm suggesting to you that it continued throughout the contractual relationship between ESCOM and Optimum. That issue about size continued. <coughs> It, it did continue up until October 2015 when that crusher was switched off. After October 2015, there, there were instances where the sizing still did not meet the specification, but there was a significant improvement. What do you mean there was significant improvement? Meaning that the beforehand, the minus 0 0.81 millimeter size fraction that was reported on a daily basis by the laboratories were in the region of 30-35%. That, uh, that then dropped to around 18%, 19%, and there was even instances where it dropped below 15%. So it, it, it significantly reduced. All right. Thank you. Can I then take you back to your statement uh, at page 5? You begin a new topic relating to the declaration of hardship by Optimum Code. Again, the chairperson has heard evidence relating to how Optimum Coal Mine declared hardship, and the result of it was that the parties decided to conclude a cooperation agreement. You are aware of that development? Yes, I am. Yes. Can I ask you to deal with paragraph 25? You may have dealt with parts of it when you testified about some significant improvement to the sizing problem, but just to complete your evidence, can I ask you to deal with paragraph 25?
So, um, this paragraph um, records that the senior management team of PED, uh, that's the primary energy division, met with representatives of Glencore on the 12th of August 2013, and I make note that I can't recall that I was part of that meeting, to discuss and agree on the revision of the sizing requirements of the coal supply agreement. This meeting is recorded in a letter uh, from OCM dated 21 August, which is attached. Uh, Eskom requested further information on OCM to negotiate the matter in good faith um, in a letter dated 18 October. So I think this refers to my previous statement where Optimum responded to uh, pardon me, Eskom responded to Optimum requesting additional information to substantiate this increase in the sizing specification. Yes. And that letter of 21 August 2013 is on page 210. But it seems to me when I read paragraph four of that letter that at best for the parties, there was a mere proposal by Optimum Coal concerning the sizing issues. And that is as far as matters went at that point in time. In other words, there was no agreement. There was a mere proposal between the parties. Correct. Correct. All right. Then you take the issue further from paragraph 26 when you talk about reference to arbitration do you see that yes but that arbitration to be clear is on a different matter it is on a hardship dispute declared by optimum coal correct that's correct and do you know what was the reason for that hardship declared by Optimum Coal? I can't recall the exact reason of that hardship uh, claim, but I would like to believe that it related to the imposition of these sizing penalties that has been accrued over a long period of time, which were placed on record um, over numerous, uh, with numerous uh, correspondence, and also at the end that at this po point in time, there has been several efforts to try and identify the origin of the sizing, and the teams have still failed to do it. Um, at this moment in time, we, in August 2013, or there around, so it's still way before October 2015 when Mr. Fuegas identified the issue. Yes. So the parties resolved to go to arbitration to resolve the sizing issue arising from declaration of hardship. And you know, Mr. Opperman, that that arbitration was not finally concluded through an award of the arbitrator. The parties agreed to settle the arbitration dispute. You know that. Um, I recall that uh, the parties entered a cooperation agreement where the, the, this, the hardship was sort of set aside, if, if I can... Was suspended. That suspended, yes. that's the correct word. Yes, yes. In your statement, you refer to the cooperation agreement. Chair, we have looked at it. Um, I would simply want to direct the attention of Mr. Opperman to parts of it. But we looked at it in detail when uh, Glenko's witness testified. On yeah. Mr... Um, Opperman's documentation, you will find it at page 212. Yes. Mr. Opperman, are you at page one, uh, 213? Yes, I am. You will see that uh, that page records the basis of the cooperation agreement. Uh, you will find it in paragraph 3 on page 213. Are you there? Yes. And then if you go to 
the next page, and I'm referring to clause 5.2. you will see that there is an agreement to suspend the hardship arbitration. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And if you go to paragraph 5.4 on the same page, you will see that there is a constitution of the negotiating teams and your name comes up in paragraph 5.4. Do you see that? Yes. And lastly, if you go to page 216, I'll skip the rest, you will see that there's a timetable on various matters that the parties had to negotiate and must agree by certain specific dates. The one which is of importance to you would be the date by which a new coal supply agreement ought to be negotiated and if necessary concluded. That would be 31 March 2015. Do you see that? Yes. Mr. Opperman, we know that you were part and parcel of the negotiating team, correct? Can you just explain from your perspective whether the negotiations were successful or not? Um, I think it's important to note uh, what my function was in this negotiation team. Yes. Um, so um, this is a process that is facilitated by the fuel sourcing department because it will be an addendum to a contract, so it's not something that I can do. So my function in this team at this moment in time was to be the liaison between the power station and, and this team. So at this moment in time, uh, one of the provisions of, of this cooperation agreement was that there will be a, a change in the price. There is a potential extension of this agreement. Um, and at that time, because there was a change in the price, there was an expectation from the power station to also realign the coal quality parameters on this contract that might, might not have been what they wanted it to be. So my function during this period in time was to liaise with the power station and uh, the technical specialist at the power station, at the center of excellence, as well as um, the RT&D um, department uh, that has been in, uh, reported on previously, um, to, I, to identify or get to a point where we could get the best benefit going forward. Yes. So, so we all realized it's going to be most probably an increased price. Uh, that's where the hardship related from. So it will be an increased price, but let's also have a look at the, at the coal quality parameter. Yes. And your sounding board was the people who operated the power station. Correct. So you would go and talk to them about what the negotiations were all about, and they will tell you their requirements. That's correct. And you'll take those requirements back to the negotiation. That's correct. All right. We now know that as a result of that process of negotiations, the parties decided to formulate a draft fourth addendum, correct? That's correct. What I want to confirm with you is to the extent that the draft fourth addendum dealt with questions of price for the supply of coal to Henrina, you would have received the input from those who operated Henrina at that point in time about whether or not they were comfortable with that level of a proposed price. Yes, I think in, in a way, although the main focus with the engagement at Indrina was to look at the coal quality parameters. Yes. One need to appreciate that those parameters and the price walks hand in hand. I mean, so I, I, I can't say 
no yeah. boys. Yeah. But the, the, the price primarily was driven by the negotiations. I understand. Okay. The price is the other side of the coin relating to coal quality. Correct. I mean, the two go ha hand in hand. And what I want to understand from you is on both scores, that is price and quality, you always had a sounding board from the, the mines, the power stations. Yes. Sorry, the power station, yes. Correct? That's correct. So whatever was reflected on the draft fourth addendum reflected the level of comfort by those who operated the mine. 100%. Yes. So, Mr. Chair, maybe just to get back um, to, to answer the previous question um, in full, um, the question was um, what aspects did the fourth addendum address um, that I was responsible for? And, and I think if one goes to the fourth addendum, um, there was a couple of matters that needed clarification, um, some that included the, the interpretation and the implementation of this penalty, because there was clearly still not alignment around that. Um, the second I aspect was the implementation and the execution of the sampling process, because we, we are now at the point where we started questioning the sampling process. We're not in, in October 2015 yet, but at this moment in time we're saying that modification that was done in 2012, did we do the right thing? Are we in a position where we might need to do something different? Um, then there was the continued failure from Optimum to supply the right size grading coal. Um, so so the, the issue was still there. Optimum still had the belief that it originates from their mining, uh, and, and we were not too sure about that. Um, there was also an issue that just before the cooperation agreement also came to light, and that was, um, or came to the table, and that was a, a reduced availability of conveyor belts. So because Optimum had to, to give this coal over a conveyor belt to Indrina, and Indrina power station had some breakdowns on these belts, Optimum were of the view that they could not supply the coal. So we were issuing them, or I was issuing them with short supply notifications, but they were contesting that they, they were not able to supply, su supply the coal. And then I think the last one um, was the whole price adjustment on the size fraction, which we still didn't know how to do the sizing. Um, and, and maybe I can, I can explain on it. Um, when, when one gets to the sizing parameter in the coal supply agreement that's applied, it talks about measuring the coal sizing on a monthly average. But yet there is no penalty mechanism that talks to this monthly average. Yes. The only pe penalty mechanism that exists on this contract is this three day, four day, five day, six day, and seven day rolling period. Yes. And there was this disconnect on how to align it. So even though all this time we've been accruing this sizing penalty that was calculated, there was this very strong disconnection between the two parties on how to really calculate this the sizing penalty. So that was also something that we wanted to try and attempt and, and resolve with the fourth addendum. So, so maybe in a way the fourth addendum was doing a bit what the third addendum should have done. Yes, yes. Um, you explain a lot about the negotiation process. I'm not going to take you through them because that's not the point. The point is that the negotiations re resulted in some kind of an understanding as between the negotiating teams, and that is to formulate a draft fourth addendum. Correct. Um, we'll, we'll get to it in due course, hopefully. But for now, after the fourth addendum was presented in draft form, those who were negotiating sought to get a mandate from decision makers in ESCOM in order to authorize the execution of the fourth addendum. Correct. And in your bundle of documents, you enclose a submission that was made to the board of directors. 
You will find that chair on page 231. Yes. Before I take you to that board submission, I'd like you to explain something to us in your statement. Uh, it is in paragraph 35 on page 8. Yes, I'm there. Are you there? I am. Yes. You will see there, you introduce a discussion you had with the Hawks. That's correct. About two letters. Can you indicate to us how the Hawks sought to interview you about these two letters? What was so important about these two letters that the Hawks decided to interview you about them? If you want to look at those two letters, you will find them from page two to six of your bundle. I have looked at those letters from page two to six. I must confess, I don't know why would these documents would be so serious and of interest to the Hawks that they would want to in interview you on them. I cannot comment on the on the reason why the Hawks made reference to the letters. Um, I uh, merely included them at the time because I thought maybe it might be referenced in some way at some stage. But I think these two letters were letters that was um, signed by Mr. Nguwe, uh, my senior at the time, uh, putting on record um, the coal supply commitment and uh, the relation to the sizing penalty that was still at this stage um, sort of put on hold, um, if I can say it like that. Yeah, Mr. Opperman, you, like me, have looked at these two letters. They merely record failure by Optimum Coal to meet its contractual obligations relating to the supply of coal correct yes that's correct sir. the uh, this letter set out what has always been escom's position correct what was so unique about them i can't say you can't say okay all right uh, can you go to the board submission on page 31, 231? You have read this board submission before, correct? Correct. Uh, did you make any input? to this submission? I was party to the negotiation team, um, so I, I would like to believe that I did make inputs. I was not party to the drafting of this document, but surely my involvement in the negotiation team would have meant that there is comments in here that related to my involvement. Yes. In other words, part of this document reflects your input in the negotiations. Correct. Right. I'm going to reflect on two parts of this, maybe more, but for now, I'd like you to go to page 232. Two. Uh, 
And so I'm going to read the paragraph beginning with PED. Primary Energy Division now requires a mandate to conclude negotiations with Optimum to ensure security of supply to Henrina. Do you see that? Yes. From your perspective, that must have been a legitimate reason why you sought a mandate to conclude the negotiations, because security of supply for coal to your power station is a very vital part of your business operations. Correct? Yes, it, yes, it is. Yes. And I continue. Hence, it is requested that the Board of Directors resolves that Primary Energy Division is mandated to conclude negotiations with Optimum Coal Mine to ensure security of supply for Henrina Power Station. Uh, and you put something in brackets, February 2015 money values for a CV of 25, 23.5, I don't know what that means, dry basis, from 1 April 2015 to 31st December 2018. And to include this new coal supply agreement, the following available rights to be exercised by 31st December 2015. Do you see that? Yes. There's a price point that you reflect there of 442 rent per ton. Do you see that? Yes. It seems to me that a request for mandate in regard to that price point was something that you as negotiator supported. Yes. You're quite comfortable with that price? Yeah, I, that was the price at the time that we were talking about. Yes. Can I take you to page 233? <coughs> And the and first what page, I'm sorry? Two double three. Okay. The first bullet point there, and let me read it out to you and ask for your comment. Primary energy division is mandated to negotiate with optimum for the full optimum reserve slash resource and production for ESCOM supply to Henrina and for other ESCOM power station, including but not limited to Tutuka and Arnold power stations, should it be possible to achieve an average cost per ton at or below 500 per ton from 1 April 2015 to 31st December 2018, and at a cost below 527 rent per ton from 1 January 2019 up to 31 December 2035. Do you see that? Yes. What I'd like you to help us with is that this point at which you, 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 you seek this mandate reflects on two things. The one is the supply to Hendrina during the lifetime of the existing CSA, which we know was going to come to an end around 31 December 2018. Correct. But you were also looking for a mandate to look beyond that period. Correct? Yes. And you said the second leg of the future period you're looking at would begin from 1 January 2019 to 31st, to 31st December 2035. Do you see that? Yes. More or less 15 years going forward. Yes. Yes. I read this to mean that you were so concerned about the security of supply concerning coal from Optimum Mine, 
that you wanted to make sure that you secure it for the lifetime of that mine. Correct? Correct. Yes. And your security of supply concerns also went beyond Hendrina. You also, you also wanted to secure supply to other mines, correct? To other power stations, correct. Yes. yes. You know by now that that did not happen. Correct? Correct. Yes. You are someone who's in charge of the management of mining operations. And you are part and parcel of this recommendation. And this recommendation is not endorsed by decision makers in ESCOM. How did that impact on your responsibilities to properly manage Arnott and Hendrina? Firstly, it significantly impacted on, on the future supply uh, post December 2018. Um, plus, at the time when we were looking at this coal supply, there must have been a need for coal at the Tuka and Arnold power stations as well. So it most it most definitely was not a a very well received decision to say now we're not going ahead and we're losing losing these volumes. That is on the second part of it. On the first part of it, what was said about it is that this coal supply would have been a coal supply over a conveyor belt to Indrina Power Station. And in hindsight, where we are sitting today, we, we are now trucking in all the coal to this power station. Um, and at that moment in time, because there was this this hardship that was there, there was all these issues that was there, we realized that there is the potential of losing this coal supply completely to Indrina Power Station, and we felt very strong about it. And with the greatest of respect, it is not in hindsight. It was clearly foreseeable that if you lose these volumes from Hendrina, which was transporting stockpile via a conveyor belt, you would have to procure them elsewhere. Most oh, certainly, yes. And that would be increased logistical transportation costs. I mean, it's, it, it was so foreseeable that either you have this, if you don't have this, you're going to have the worst. Correct? 100%. And Mr. Chair, I, I think that that partly also contributed to, to this price where we how we got to this price. Yes. Um, I, I, it's common knowledge or public knowledge at this moment that we know that the optimum price at this moment in time was around 200 rand a ton. Yes. So to sit and look at an amount of 442 rand a ton, that's a significant jump. Yes. But the coin side to this uh, is exactly what, what you're saying. It was contracting coal from another source and bringing it in by a truck most probably landing it at this cost or slightly more. Yes. And I know that you are not a board member of ESCOM, and I know that you are not a member of the senior executives of ESCOM. But on your evidence and on your approach, I suggest to you that it is reckless in the extreme for decision makers not to adopt this recommendation unless they have something much better that can compete with this recommendation. What is your comment to that proposition? Um, I, I agree. The, the much better could have been to just default to the original coal supply agreement. Yes. Anyway, uh, you know now that this mine, as we speak today, it is no longer operational, correct? Correct. And Hendrina is no longer sourcing its coal from uh, optimum coal mine. That's correct. Yes. And that mine is just like a scrapyard. Correct? Yes. Yes. 
So as we speak, Hendrena would be sourcing its coal from elsewhere. That is correct. Do you know when is it getting its coal? Um, it's most probably currently getting its coal from three or four different other sources. Um, and it's, it's, it's not all directly close to, to Indrina Power Station. It's in the, in the Whitbank area. Yes. But, but it's multiple deliveries from multiple sources. Chair, through you, can I ask Mr. Opperman to do a calculation for us? Uh, to yes. see precisely what is the cost implication for procuring coal from other sources uh, to Hendrina. I'd like you to do that calculation for us to see whether or not there was value for money for ESCOM to reject this proposal and to find itself as we speak in a totally different set of circumstances for procuring coal far away from the power station. Are you able to do that for us? Yes, I, I do have um, some amounts with me. Right. Um, and if I try and relate it, Mr. J, to, to the period which was around June 2013, so uh, June 2015, um, and I just go back to the cost of coal um, delivered over that period, um, at that moment in time, the, the Indrina um, cost was around 159 rand a ton. And uh, the, the landed cost for coal delivered via road trucks was around 450 rand a ton. For now, I'll work with that figure of 450 rand per ton going forward. All right. Uh, I'll come back to this figure at some point because we know that this request for mandate was not given by the board of ESCOM. I'm going to jump ahead to the next development that happened after this draft fourth addendum was not approved by the board. You will get that next development at page 249. Chair, you will recall that Mr. Efron dealt with this in the context of his evidence to the effect that when he was told that the fourth addendum was not approved by the board, he then approached Mr. Malefe to try and understand why. And thereafter, when he was told that ESCOM was not happy with the fourth addendum, and in fact they were not going to sign it, he decided to renegotiate by re-looking at the cost that was quoted in the fourth addendum and reduced it by means of the proposal set at page 249. And I'd like to deal with that proposal from your perspective, Mr. Opperman. You attached this proposal in your bundle of documents, correct? Correct. I take it, therefore, that you are aware of this proposal. Correct. How did you become aware of it? I would like to think that it was shared with the negotiation team at that moment in time. Um, this... This proposal was addressed to Mr. Johan Bester as the general manager in fuel sourcing, yes. which was part of the uh, negotiation team at that stage. Um, so I can't recall exactly how I got hold of it, but I would like to think that it was shared in a forum where we, as a negotiation team on the ESCOM side, met to say, well, there's a revised proposal on the table, because ultimately this was something different to the previous mandate that was compiled for, for submission to yes. the board. So it's fair to approach your evidence on the basis that you received it at the point in time when Mr. Efron revived the negotiations, correct? Correct. Yes. The date is 30 June 2015. I'm going to skip it. 
and the introductory paragraph says the following. We refer to the meeting held at ESCOM on 11 June 2015 between your Mr. Molefe and Mr. Mboweni and our Mr. Ivan Glassenberg and Clinton Efron. As discussed at the meeting, Optimum is willing to consider a compromise deal in relation to the negotiation and extension of the Hendrina Supply Agreement. We have given consideration as to what sort of compromise would be feasible in the circumstances, and accordingly we hereby submit this revised offer for ESCOM's consideration. The proposed new agreement would supersede the existing Hendrina Coal Supply Agreement and be in full and final settlement of all pending disputes and claims. I'd like to take you to the question of price first. It's up to you if you want to highlight any issue relating to commencement and duration. But for me, the important issue relates to price. The offered price is for the period 1 July 2015 to 31 December 2018, which is described as the first period. The base price as at 1 July 2015 is 300 per ton. Do you see that? Yes. That's a significant revision from the price proposed in the fourth addendum. Do you see that? That is correct, uh, Mr. Chair. What is of importance to note as well is that this quality parameter now also now again defaulted to the original contract qualities yes. and not the higher qualities as was what was negotiated. Indeed, and we'll get to that. But for now, insofar as price is concerned, there is a proposed reduction on my calculation of something in the order of 142 42. rent per ton. That's correct. Compared to the previous price proposed in the fourth addendum. On price alone, that reduction is almost a third of the price previously agreed. Do you agree with it? I agree with it. Yes. We'll, we'll come to the coal quality parameters because I'd like you to help us. And then you will see that there is a second price proposed for what is called the second period. You will find it in the second bullet under the heading or column price. From 1 January 2019 to 31 December 2023, the second period, the base price as at the base date will be 570 rand per ton. Do you see that? Yes. This, of course, as a second period, is the one that comes after the initial period of the CSA comes to an end, correct? Correct. So it's, again, a futuristic view that Glencoe adopts that we would like to supply to secure your security of supply beyond the existing CSA, correct? That is correct. I think, uh, Mr. Chair, what's important to just also note if we're trying to compare apples with apples, we, because we're relating this to the mandated document, is to note that the original mandated document for this period was 500 rand a ton. Yes. So the price is now higher. Yes. Um, again, it is still at the original contract qualities, not at the higher qualities that we negotiated. Yes. So most probably at this moment in time, this coal will not be suitable for Arnott. Yes. So one is losing some alternatives, but I agree. If the strategy was to secure coal for the long term, this does deal with that. All right. Then there is another part of this offer which is quite interesting, and I'd like you to comment on it. If you go to page 250... I'll skip the coal quantity, which is expressed in the first bullet point. I'll go to the second bullet point. It says, ESCOM shall be entitled 
by no later than 31 December 2015 to implement and conclude a tender process to obtain a bona fide written offers from third party coal suppliers. Do you see that? Yes. It seems to me that the implication of this clause, Mr. Opperman, is to offer an opportunity to ESCOM to go and test the market. That is correct. On whether they can get a better offer. Correct? That is correct. Yeah. And normally that's how public entities such as ESCOM operate. You go out to the market to test whether or not there is a competitive, cost-effective, and transparent deal. Correct? That's correct. Yes. If you were part of the negotiations, would you have supported this part of the offer? To go out to the market to test y it? Yes, I will, because I would like to confirm that the price is reasonable. Yes. And then the third bullet point tells us what will happen if ESCOM had gone out to the market and had received a better offer. Optimum will be obliged to or will be entitled to match that offer. Correct? That's correct. Yes. Subject to the question of coal quality, what is your view of this offer? I think it was reasonable. One need to consider that at this moment in time, um, the price of coal at the Indrina power station was maybe around 175 rand a ton. So 300 rand a ton for the same quality might seem like a lot of money, but obviously this opens up that extended 15 year window with some security. So I think it's reasonable. Yes. Considering, considering the mandated document that was drafted, uh, this is a good proposal. Yes. You know that this proposal was not accepted yes, by I the do. decision makers in ESCOM. Yes, I do. Yes. Were you told why it was not accepted? No, I was not told. As you sit there in the witness box, with hindsight, because I believe that's a term that you used before, were you able to get the reasons why this offer was not accepted by the decision makers in ESCOM? No, I, I was not able. You see, what troubles me is this, that this offer contemplated a genuine procurement and competitive proposal out there in the market. What happened later is that it's something else. ESCOM agrees to cede the shares in Optimum Coal P2I Limited to a third party who is together without any competitive bidding process to supply coal to that mine to that power station. Yes. I'm sure when those who made that decision come before this commission, we will ask questions around how they decided to implement a different strategy of session. From your perspective, Did things change in relation to Optimum Coal Mine after this offer was rejected? When I say things change, I refer to coal quality. Did that change? Not really what I could recall. The price remained the same. Correct. And that was 
about less than 200 per ton. That's correct. Yes. I'd like to take you back to your statement. And Chair, I'm at page eight. You deal with the question of the rejection of both the fourth addendum and the subsequent offer that we have dealt with a moment ago from paragraph 39 of your statement. Correct? That's correct. And in paragraph 42, you say, I do not know why Mr. Brian Molefe made this decision to stop the settlement proposal, the pro settlement process, as I did not have any personal discussion with him regarding the matter prior to this decision. You see that? From your perspective, did anyone ever consult with you to tell you that they're going to reject the fourth addendum proposal and the proposal from Mr. Clinton Efron of June 2015. Were you consulted on that score? No, I was never consulted, Jim. Okay. And then in paragraph 43, you say that the cancellation of the cooperation agreement reinstated the hardship arbitration. Dated 23 June 2015. Do you see that? Yes. All right. Before I get to paragraph 44, can I ask you this? Do you know what was the upshot of that arbitration on hardship? I'm not sure if I understand the question. What happened to that arbitration which was reinstated after the cancellation of the cooperation agreement? Remember, the fourth addendum is not approved. Yeah. Remember, the arbitration was suspended. Because of the lack of approval of the fourth addendum and the cancellation of the cooperation agreement, the arbitration is revived. Correct. Mr. Clinton told us a lot about it. Mr. Efron, rather, told us a lot about it. What I want to understand from you is, do you know what ultimately happened to that arbitration? Um, I don't know what happened with that arbitration other than Glencore going into business rescue in August, two months later. Yes. In, from paragraph four, so let me go to paragraph 44, which I skipped. There you say there was a meeting between Mr. Malefe, Mr. Mboweni, and Mr. Glassenbeck, and Mr. Efron on 11 June 2015. Following this meeting, OCM made a revised offer, which was sent to ESCOM on 30 June 2015. And that is the offer we've looked at, correct? Correct. All right. So we can comfortably go to the next topic you deal with, which is your topic on the imposition of penalties. Do you see that? Yes. You start with that topic from paragraph 45. In paragraph 46, you refer to a Mr. Christo Kruger of the primary energy division as someone who made the calculation of the penalties imposed, correct? Correct. What I find interesting with that part of your statement, you say, I do not know how Mr. Christo Kruger calculated the penalty amount and or how it was applied to the CSA and or the relevant addendums to the CSA. Do you see that? Yes. Can I ask you some few questions around that? We have looked at your mandate. We have looked at your job description and you have explained to us how they work. And the sum total of what you explained to us is that you were someone who was responsible for the calculation of penalties, uh, including the input from the scientist and the input from the financial division, correct? Correct. 
why would Mr. Christo Kruger take it upon himself to do the calculation on penalties that ultimately were imposed? Mr. Kruger is supporting me on a finance point of view and they will do these calculations. Mm -hmm. um, maybe for clarification, point number 46, what I meant by this is that at the moment when Mr. Kruger did this calculation, I did not understand the method that this calculation was, uh, this penalty was derived to or how it was got, how he got to that amount. And the reason was because of this continued um, difference in interpretation on, like for instance, the application of the sizing, where the sizing is measured on a monthly average but applied on a three, four, three to seven day rolling period. I am I'm not trying to say that I don't agree to the 2.1 million, but it was merely the way that it was calculated at that moment in time, there was not a common understanding between, between Glencore and ESCOM, this is how we are going to determine the qualities. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you might have to just clarify the position with regard to your position with regard to uh, this 2.1 billion rand, because when you talked about it for the first time earlier this morning, uh, the first answer that I think you gave to Mr. Malega's question or his question may have been based on the understanding that you did not agree with that amount. But uh, you subsequently said, as I understood you, that you had no problem with the amount uh, of 2,1 billion, but there was some other issue, and I can't remember whether it was the method of calculation. I think I did ask you whether your, your issue related to the method of calculation or the means by which they had arrived at that amount. You gave a certain answer, yeah. and, uh, and uh, now I hear that you say you, uh, you, you, you don't have a problem with that amount, I think you say now again. Um, but I saw something here also, yeah, in Prayer 47. Yes. Uh, you specifically, well, the first line of paragraph 27, you say, I was later informed that the penalty amount calculated by Mr. Christo Kruger came to about 2,1 billion rand. And in the next sentence, you say, I was not in agreement with the amount since, and then you proceed. So right now, I'm not sure exactly whether you agreed at the time with the amount of 2,1 billion rand, but you don't agree now, or whether you agree now with that amount, but you didn't agree with it then, and if you didn't agree what the basis was for your not agreeing with it, I'm not sure. Do you want to take your time and try and explain to me what your position was then in regard to the amount and what your position is now? with regard to that amount and to the extent that there may have been differences of how that amount was, um, how you arrived at that amount or the basis of your disagreement, please just explain it. Uh, making a distinction between what your position was then and what your position is now to the extent that there may be a difference between the two positions. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What I tried to explain this morning was to say that at the time of this calculation being done to 2.1 million in this moment in time, Mr. Kruger's reference point and the reference point that myself and Mr. Needham from Glencore did was different. In the sense that the Glencore view and, and the reference point that I used was to only account for the sizing penalty from May 2012 up until April 2013, which was the date when Optimum issued the letter indicating that they want to renegotiate the sizing penalty. So I only considered the sizing 
penalty up until that period. And if you consider that period, it gave me this amount of around 720 million. If I consider Mr. Kruger's point of reference where he looked at the penalty period, uh, the sizing penalty for the full period, it gets to 2.2 million. No, 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 no. Look at your statement. We now know that for the, when the penalty is imposed for the first time, it is in the amount of 2.1 million. million. Correct. And we know that it's around June, July, August when the penalties were imposed correct. in the order of 2.1 billion. That's correct. Correct? At that point in time, your view is you don't agree with Mr. Christo Kruger's calculation because you took a view that on the interpretation of the agreement, that amount was too high. In 2015, because that reference point of 2015 is the last point at which the penalties are calculated in the order of 2.1 billion, correct? Correct. If you take that reference point, you came to a totally different conclusion that the calculation of 2.1 billion was too excessive. In fact, you came to the conclusion that the appropriate amount was something in the order of 720 million rent, give or take rents and cents, correct? Correct, based on my interpretation indeed. of the contract. Indeed, correct. indeed. So to answer the chairperson's point, and that's the reason why we called your evidence here, is to tell us that as far as ESCOM is concerned, there was not a consistency of position at that point in time about the nature and extent of the penalty it ought to impose? I would not say that. Um, if I can take you to Annex Year 18, which is my calculation sheet that I attached to my statement. Can I read this and ask you to confirm before and we go there? Maybe before it's read, let me ask this question, Mr. Oprahman. Let's go back to the position when you either had or saw for the first time that Mr. Christo Kruger had reached the total amount of 2,1 billion rand in his calculations. Correct. Okay. I take it that at a certain stage you familiarized yourself with how he came to that amount. Is that right? Correct. And uh, in doing so, you got to understand that he interpreted the agreement in a certain way. Is that right? I interpreted it in the same way. You interpreted it. You agreed with his interpretation. 100%, yes. Okay. Um, uh, at that stage, what was your attitude to the outcome of that calculation? namely 2,1 billion rand, did you take the view that his outcome was correct? The calculation to get to the 2.1 billion was correct and I supported it. My interpretation of the coal supply agreement from a contract management point of view said that I should not apportion the sizing penalty after Optimum issued a letter to ask can we please renegotiate the sizing, which was in April 2013. So, so if you take the same calculation that Mr. Kruger did and the same calculation that I have in my annex year and you, remove, and, and you add the sizing penalties from uh, April, May 2013 uh, till, till 2015, in fact, I get to a value of 2.27 million. So yeah. we are there and there about on the same on the same volume. Yes. So, 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 if you were the one who had been asked to make the calculation instead of Mr. Kruger being the one who was asked, what is the total that you would have arrived at uh, on your own understanding of what was to be taken into account? and what was not to be taken into account in calculating the amount. 
what was the amount that you would have come to? 723 million, and it's based on the fact that I did not include the sizing penalty post the date at optimum request the renegotiation. So, and, and did Mr. Kruger uh, do something different in regard to that item? He included the sizing post April 2013. And you excluded it? I excluded it. You would it. have excluded it, and when Correct. you calculated, you excluded Correct. it? Correct. Now, as far as you were concerned, was he wrong to include it? Mr. Chair, I, I don't know. Um, we, you don't we, know? We don't, have, we don't have that advice on what it should be. Was the sizing penalty out at that uh, post-April 2013? Yes, it was out. Should they have been penalized? Maybe they should have been penalized. Um, from, from a contract management point of view, there was just this, um, let me call it this, this peg in the ground where we said, well, the penalties, because you did not contest the penalties, it sense that you, my sense was that you accepted it. So up until April 2013, you did not contest the penalties, so in my mind you accepted it. But in April 2013, you asked, can we please rene renegotiate it? And in my view, that is a, a period where the sizing penalty should have been dealt with differently. If a decision was to say, what is the total penalty at this moment in time that needs to be levied, most probably it would have been 2.1 billion. But from what you say, it, it seems clear to me that you took a view that, I can't remember what you said it was, that it, that should be excluded in the calculation. What was that? Yeah, the sizing penalty post yeah, 20. Side, yeah, sliding penalties. Sizing penalties. Sizing penalties. Yeah. yeah, you took the view that they should be excluded from the calculation. Post April 23rd. Yes, yes. but Mr. Kruger took the view that they should be included. Correct. Yes. That because of the different views that you both took, you didn't come to the same conclusion, outcome. Is that right? He came to 2.1 billion rand. You came to about 700 and something million rand. Correct. So now, I don't understand why you would then, in the light of this, still say you agreed with his amount of 2.1 billion when your view was there was something he took into account which took him to that amount, that total, which in your view should not be taken into account. Why, why, do, you, why, why do you say you agreed with his, with his total of 2.1 billion right there? The method of calculating the 2.1 billion rand pen penalty, I agree with. So the two, total but of 2.1... But what, it includes what you think should be excluded, isn't it? Exactly, but, but the, the fact that I'm including or excluding a portion, that is an interpretation of the relationship or the communication that has happened under this contract. So if you, if you consider the quality parameters and the penalty provisions against this contract, and you do a calculation, the calculation is 2.1 billion. If you now go and look at what has happened in this life of the power station, it means that somewhere in this life, and that happened in April 2013, there was an engagement which said, we contest this sizing uh, uh, penalty, and we want to renegotiate it. And yes, there was a process that followed after that that, that didn't conclude at the time when even the cooperation agreement was signed or the fourth addendum was signed. And hence the reason why in the fourth addendum it was included to say that the parties need to agree on, on this historical penalty because there was no agreement. There was no agreement between Glencore and Eskom at that moment in time on how it should be calculated. But... Uh, as I understand it, and you must just tell me if there's, there's something I misunderstand, as I understand what was being calculated was, uh, uh, was uh, the total amount of penalties Correct. that ESCOM was entitled to. Correct. Okay. Now, I take it Mr. Kruger was asked, please calculate for us what we are owed as ESCOM in terms of the total penalties. Correct. 
he came to the amount of 2.1 billion rand. Correct. By whatever method he came to that amount. Correct, yes. Now, if you were asked, or you were asked, or you decided to calculate the total penalties that ESCOM was entitled to, is that right? On your own. Yes. And you arrived at 700 and something million rand. Is that right? The, the calculation mm. that I did actually came to 2.2 billion rand. Now, let me ask this question before I allow Mr. <laughs> Malega to continue. Uh, but what was your answer, and maybe what is your answer now also, as to what was ESCOM, what penalties as a total was ESCOM entitled to at that time, in your view? In my view, it should have been somewhere around 2 billion rand, because the agreement to exclude the SI or, or, um, the, um, the decision to exclude the sizing penalty post-April 2013 when the request was made to exclude it. That, that portion of penalties that was excluded, which is the balance between 720 million and the 2.1 billion, will most probably be something that the parties would have negotiated and agreed to. But the penalty that was due to Eskom is the 2.1 billion. I'm not sure if well, I'm, can any I, <laughs> I'm any yeah, wiser, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, I let you continue. Chair, that yes. is important. Yes. You know, Mr. Opperman, I don't know what is the job description and official responsibilities of Mr. Kruger, but from your perspective, I know that your job description includes the management of commercial and legal aspect relating to the CSA. Correct? Correct. So that the very issue relating to the calculation of the penalties, the very issue relating to the interpretation of the contract on how penalties must be calculated, falls squarely within your responsibilities. That's correct. Whatever interpretation you place on the CSA is an interpretation which, in all probabilities, ESCOM will be guided by you. It would be guided by me. It might not be the decision that's taken. I understand. Yes. And that's a point of the inquiry. That you come to the conclusion on the interpretation of the agreement that the good estimate of the penalty is 720 odd million rand on your own interpretation of the agreement, correct? Correct. correct. Someone we don't know on his own interpretation of the agreement comes to a totally different conclusion. Correct. On the interpretation of the agreement, that ESCOM should impose a penalty of 2.1 billion, correct? Yes. The point of the inquiry is this. Did anyone consult with you before this 2.1 billion rent penalty was imposed? No, nobody did. Someone doesn't consult with you to impose a penalty of 2.1 billion on a no. matter that falls squarely within your official responsibilities? No. And I appreciate, I, I hope that you understand why this line of inquiry is important. No, I understand. Because if it is ESCOM's position that penalties of 2.1 billion must be imposed, that position must maintain regardless of who owns the mine. Do you agree with that? I just repeat. Uh... Despite your interpretation of the agreement, and despite the fact that you contend on your interpretation for imposition of a lowered penalty, ESCOM goes ahead that I will impose a penalty of 2.1 billion. That position must remain regardless of who owns the mine. For sure. It doesn't matter whether it is owned by Dlenk or by Tegeta. Sure. For sure. Yes. Before we go to lunch, can I ask you this for your comment? Why questions of penalty suddenly become important and they reduce fundamentally to almost a hundredth when the mine is owned by a getter? Why does the penalty amount changes and comes to 250 odd million rand when I, the mine is now owned by a getter? I cannot answer that. 
Were you consulted about the 250 million rand? No. In, in fact, I only got to, to know about the settlement that was reached um, way, way after the settlement was done. I only became aware of the settlement agreement for the first time on the 23rd of January uh, 2018. You became aware of that settlement agreement when? The 23rd of January 2018. Chair, before we go for lunch, can I ask Mr. Uh, Opperman to confirm some few things? Yeah. They, are, they are common cause, but they lead me to the next topic. Um, you confirm that as a result of the imposition of the penalties on Optimum Coal Mine, it went under business rescue, correct? Correct. And that is a matter which ought to have been of concern to ESCOM. Correct. And to you as the, operate, as the manager of the various uh, mining holdings of ESCOM, sorry, power stations of ESCOM. Correct. Yes. Chair, is this a convenient time to go for a tea break? Yes, it is. Thank you. We'll take the lunch adjournment and resume at 2. We are adjourned. Thank you, Chair.